Good day and welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, Whistleblower Law and the Healthcare Industry. We are pleased to have four fantastic speakers today. Epstein Becker Green's John Fullerton, who is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice, Stuart M. Gerson, former Assistant and Acting Attorney General of the United States and a member of the firm's Healthcare and Life Sciences Practice and Litigation Practice, Frank C. Morris, Jr., who is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice, and Alan B. Roberts, who is a member of the Labor and Employment Practice. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar will be recorded and the participant phone lines will be placed in listen-only mode throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx and at the end of the webinar, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the speakers following today's webinar, and their contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. At this time, I would like to turn the webinar over to Stuart Gerson. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you'll see from this presentation, uh, there are a number of whistleblower statutes that affect uh, healthcare providers and other participants in the, in the healthcare space, but I'm gonna start uh, talking about something that you already know a good deal about, and that's the False Claims Act, the granddaddy, if you will, of, uh, of anti-fraud statutes. Uh, Dating back to the Civil War, the False Claims Act, in essence, authorizes the United States or uniquely so-called quitom relators, people acting in the name of the United States, to recover monetary damages to uh, various parties who may be submitting false or fraudulent claims for payment. Uh, why do we talk about this in the healthcare space? Well, uh, in, in recent years, in, indeed since 1986, a majority of cases brought by relators uh, uh, and, and pursued to judgments or settlements have involved health care. And some of the biggest settlements, and unfortunately not enough cases are tried uh, where the government could be put to its proof, but uh, uh, some of the biggest settlements of all, including a, almost a $400 million one yesterday uh, from DeVita, have been uh, uh, in the health in the healthcare space. The False Claims Act prohibits a broad range of activities, which are set forth on uh, uh, page seven here, uh, uh, in, including knowing presentation of a false or fraudulent claim, conspiring to, to do so using false records, failing to return money that's, or property that's owed the government. That's called a reverse false claim. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second because some recent amendments have uh, cast additional light on that. Uh, in, in essence, the act itself describes activities that we would think are fraudulent. But I want to caution you that the False Claims Act no longer is essentially a fraud statute. Uh, many of the activities, indeed several activities that have provided a lion's share of the billions of dollars that the government has, has gotten, uh, come from activities that aren't fraudulent at all. There's nothing fraudulent about off-label promotion. Indeed, uh, most of the time it involves uh, say a pharmaceutical company making an accurate statement about its products, but it's a prohibited activity. Same for kickbacks. Generally, a uh, kickback uh, doesn't result in, in uh, medical being denied, it results in it being provided. Nevertheless, the government's theory has always been that this results, this, this kind of activity results in unnecessary care, uh, and it's a prohibited act. So it doesn't make a difference that you're looking at it in classical terms of, of fraud. You need to look at it in terms of what's what's prohibited and recognize that this uh, statute is, is operated uh, under economic terms. Uh, at least Congress looks at it that way, that too much money is being spent unnecessarily on health care, and this particular statute, which allows for treble damages assessed on a per claim basis, civil penalties of up to $11,000 a, a claim, and, and very onerous uh, ancillary consequences like suspension, debarment, and exclusion that are that are set forth on, on page eight, uh, uh, make this an extremely powerful statute and that your compliance programs are, are, are to be geared uh, 
less to the fraud model than on a true compliance model to avoid prohibitive practices. Uh, because the Congress is uh, uh, constantly putting greater pressure uh, on the government, on the Justice Department and Department of Health and Human Services in particular, uh, to recover more and more money, that is to avoid what it considers to be unnecessary expenditures, although even in the, in the billions it's a pittance compared to what the, what the federal health care uh, budget looks like uh, now. Uh, still, these departments are under tremendous pressure to increase their scope uh, of, of activities under the False Claims Act, and that's been reflected in two recent rounds of amendments to the, to the False Claims Act, which really lower the bar and enable both the government and Quitom relators uh, acting in its name uh, in, a, in a way never before to, to avoid cases being dismissed and to litigate them and to cost money uh, uh, and, and time of the companies that are, that are being subject to these cases. And that's an important thing to note. It is an accurate statement for me to say that the vast majority of Quitom cases brought in healthcare and otherwise are non-meritorious. Why do I know that? because the government has since 1986, and despite the amendments to the False Claims Act, declines to intervene in about 80% of the cases. In the 20% of the, of the cases that the government does intervene in, over 90% of the recoveries that the, that the government gets are, are produced. That is that the relators proceeding on their own do relatively, extremely relatively poorly in, in comparison to the way, the way the government acts when the government intervenes. And indeed, in the cases that the government intervenes in, only a handful of those produce the overwhelming uh, hundreds of millions of dollars that add up to the billions that the government brags about every year. So the real burden of the False Claims Act and all these cases that come under it are the investigations, the negotiations, the lost opportunities, the having to deal with the government, and then in the rare occasions having to settle these cases or, or, or try them. But it's a, it's a very punishing regime that has tremendous ancillary consequences. And in some ways, uh, the, the bite is even worse than the bark. Uh, in the uh, amendments, uh, as I say, came in two tranches. The False Claims Act was amended by something called FERA, the Fraud Enforcement and Recovery Act of 2009, and then again as part of Obamacare in 2010. Uh, uh, the so-called Affordable Care Act. Uh, these are the most significant amendments to the False Claims Act since 1986, and in large part they were designed to reverse certain uh, uh, court decisions uh, that had restricted access uh, to uh, Quitom relators and uh, made it more difficult to the government, and the bar was really lowered. Uh, there was a case called Allison Engine in which uh, the, the Supreme Court, uh, echoing the plain words of the False Claims Act uh, uh, held that a, a False Claims Act actually had to be presented uh, to an agent of the United States or a member of the, of the military. That uh, requirement was eliminated. Uh, the word claim has been expanded. Uh, uh, now it's any money that's spent or used on the government's behalf. Uh, I was once able to argue successfully that uh, uh, Medicaid uh, was, was not uh, subject to False Claims Act analysis because that, uh, to the extent that it was involving state activity, we weren't talking about, about federal monies, that uh, the federal government stands behind it, contributes, but, but only indirectly is it, uh, does it administer the, uh, the Medicaid program. That argument is gone, along with a host of other arguments uh, uh, in, 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 that, in that area. So, uh, now, where, whether, whether the government provides directly or indirectly, whether it's a, a mere reimburser, as long as some government interest is being advanced uh, and uh, money is being expended by the federal government, that involves a claim. Public disclosure and original source. This had been the bellwether for years of uh, uh, limitations on, on quitom relators. Uh, now, uh, the original source uh, doctrine and public disclosure bars have really been lowered. Uh, the definitional uh, stru stricture has been substantially eased, and dismissal is not automatic. The government gets to chime in now to decide whether uh, uh, an individual uh, uh, is entitled to act as a, as a relator, even if the government is not involved in the intervention. So that's another bar that has been lowered. 
Here's one that's a, a real kicker involving those of you who get direct payments. Hospitals are a good example of that, but there's plenty of other, other companies. The Affordable Care Act provides that Medicare and Medicaid over overpayments must be reported within 60 days of discovery. Uh, this is going to be uh, one of the hottest areas of litigation. It already is the great subject of, of dispute because of RAC audits and the problems that, uh, that they have created. Uh, this is a, a big problematic area. Compliance programs are being redesigned. Many of you probably are directly familiar with this. And the problems that it raises in defining uh, when you know that you have an overpayment, uh, how exactly that's to be processed, whether offsets are available. Uh, what we know for sure is that this specific issue has been engrafted into the, fall, into the False Claims Act and can lead to treble damages actions where once you were talking about administrative negotiations uh, to resolve overpayment claims. The reverse false claim uh, has been further defined. I told you what that was a little while ago. Um, uh, and uh, again, the, the act has been uh, clarified and extended uh, under, under, under FERA. Uh, here's another big kicker. As I, as I told you, the uh, uh, kickbacks are not necessarily fraudulent. It doesn't matter that I've just told you that or that I'm correct in saying so, because now, uh, under the Affordable Care Act amendments, there's automatic equality between violation of the anti-kickback statute and the False Claims Act. Uh, it equates a criminal violation with a civil violation, and the fact of a kickback, if it's, if, even if it isn't fraudulent, if you're involved in something where fair market determinations, uh, fair market value determinations haven't been made, uh, other areas where uh, incentives have been, have been provided, uh, whatever your defenses might be and the vagaries of the, of, of the safe harbors uh, still uh, pertain, although HHS is taking a look at those as we, as we speak, uh, what we know for sure is if one has committed a kickback, automatically one also has violated the False Claims Act, is subject to treble damages, civil and administrative penalties, and ancillary penalties, including exclusion and debarment. Okay, now. We jump to, the, to litigation or the potential for litigation, and uh, here is, in, in, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the safety clause, if you will. As the bars for uh, stating a claim under the False Claims Act have been lowered, the courts have stepped in, particularly the Supreme Court, recognizing that increased litigation means increased expense, increased burden on the courts and oftentimes unfairness to defendants who, as we have demonstrated, most of the time are in the right when it comes to these kinds of cases. Uh, so we, in, in the face of these uh, 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 efforts at lowering the bar, uh, we have Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 9B uh, being more stringently interpreted by the federal courts. The two leading cases that you may know of are uh, Iqbal and Twombly, uh, in which the courts have said that uh, uh, pleading a fraud case and False Claims Act cases for these purposes, whether or not they involve actual fraud or come within the ambit of Rule 9, of 9B, have to be pleaded with particularity, including the who, what, where, when, and why uh, of the case. Uh, now, there is a, a substantial division among, uh, among the courts on how you satisfy that, uh, in the materials, we've set forth a little discussion of the, of the Third Circuit case of Folia against Renal Ventures Management, and you can see that the, the Third Circuit uh, uh, is, one of the, is one of the courts uh, that uh, uh, has a, a more lenient standard for determining uh, uh, whether a whistleblower has uh, provided uh, uh, enough description of alleged false claims uh, that a defendant effectively can know what the case is about and, and defend itself. Um, the, uh, the, there, are, there is a big split in, in the circuits on this issue, uh, the first, fifth, and ninth going one way, uh, a, uh, the, the fourth, sixth, eighth, and, and eleventh uh, taking a more, a more stringent view. Uh, many of us thought that the Supreme Court was going to take up the case because there's such a big split in the circuits on the subject, and of course that's uh, uh, one of the two reasons why the Supreme Court uh, 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 can elect to uh, grant a writ of certiorari, and the, the uh, case 
that um, uh, that led to that uh, view was was the, the case that the, the Takeda case, and uh, uh, but the Supreme Court twice has turned down cert in that case, and so this circuit split uh, hasn't been resolved. And the bottom line is, uh, while Rule 9b is potentially a, a good bar to uh, uh, insubstantial False Claims Act cases, um, a lot depends on which circuit, which district in which circuit you're litigating in. So you need to be careful and, and, and look at that, unless and until the Supreme Court takes up one of these cases uh, and decides the matter definitively. Uh, so this is an abiding split in, in, the, in the circuit, in the circuits, and we're, we're watching it closely. One thing to understand is that while the Supreme Court is often argued by, by liberals, particularly, uh, to be a, a business favorable court, uh, when it comes to whistleblowers, the exact opposite is true. Uh, except for the Garcetti case, which involves a public employee in a, in a, in a in the sort of case that has virtually nothing to do with anything that a, that a private business or a, or a not-for-profit uh, normally does. Other than that case, whistleblowers have prevailed in every single case in which their status as whistleblowers uh, and, and claims of retaliation have been involved. Uh, the courts are, are determined to uh, uh, allow uh, uh, whistleblowers to bring these cases. They read statutes very literally. And while the early cases have to do with the, with the False Claims Act, I'll go beyond my topic a little and tell you that the same protections are going to be applied as to Sarbanes-Oxley, as to the 30-plus uh, whistleblower protection statutes that exist throughout the, the, uh, the, the federal statute book. Uh, so uh, uh, understand that uh, uh, anti-retaliation provisions, in this case the so-called H claims under the, under the False Claims Act, uh, receive very high levels of protection all the way up to, always up to the Supreme Court. What does that tell you in terms of your compliance programs? We'll talk about that a little later, but needless to say, uh, you want to make uh, uh, whistleblowers part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So uh, uh, act, act accordingly. Um, the next slide that says enforcement and litigation trends is probably the most important of the slides in, in, in my presentation. I urge you to read it and read it carefully because this is what you ought to be thinking about in terms of focusing your compliance programs on, on specific items. Uh, there is heightened concern in the, in the C-suite about the top enforcement trend, which is more criminal cases. You can't send a, a company to jail, and the government is under greater and greater pressure to uh, achieve jail sentences, and what that means is more criminal cases against individuals and not unlikely assertions of the so-called responsible corporate officer doctrine. That's going to bring up constitutional claims uh, uh, that involve uh, mens rea or the absence of that. But certainly, uh, D's and O's are much more conscious of the fact that if they're touching the activities that, the, that are being complained of by the government or relators, that they are increasingly subject to potential criminal cases. Uh, similarly, uh, HHS is uh, uh, going further, the Office of Inspector General, in excluding executives under relaxed standards. Another thing to think about. Uh, uh, there are the Purdue Pharma case, which has been litigated back and forth, is a good example, good from the standpoint of the government at least, as to where uh, uh, corporate executives uh, have, have been uh, subject to sanctions. Stuart, that's going to complicate the ability to settle these matters even more, isn't it? Yes, it really, it really will, uh, and it raises a whole bunch of, of subordinate questions, like who gets attorney-client privilege uh, and how, how that can be maintained, whether the board can supersede that. It means that there are executives that are going to be cut loose because conflicts are, are perceived. You're right, Frank. It, 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 it uh, uh, augurs a host of other problems that, uh, that people in this space have to, have to be aware of. Uh, the government increasingly is bringing cases uh, alleging uh, false claims act violations in, on the so-called worthless services theory. Uh, that got a bad blow in recent times, when, just a few days ago, when uh, the Seventh Circuit on Banc uh, upheld an earlier decision uh, that uh, rejected this theory. Uh, but the government is, is pursuing it nevertheless and uh, with, a, with a managed care bent. Uh, 
uh, to pick up on something that Frank and I just discussed, another trend is withering of the attorney-client privilege, uh, the, the application of the so-called crime fraud exception. And uh, uh, again, uh, read up United States against Upjohn, read some of the recent cases that involve privilege, uh, make sure that privileged documents are handled in a way that reflects it, that they're so marked, uh, that it's clear who the attorney and who the client is, and that uh, legal advice is being sought or, or given. Uh, I think that we're going to see increasing challenges under the Eighth Amendment uh, to the penalties that are being imposed in False Claims Act cases uh, under the Excessive Fines Clause. Uh, it is argued uh, that the government ought to be confined to its actual loss. The government, as you may know, has argued in case after case that if there's any False Claims Act difficulty with a claim, the whole claim is invalid, uh, not just the overpayment part of it. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a subject, I think, of increasing uh, analysis as it's easier and easier for relators in the government to bring these cases. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at the, at the present and near future, uh, I think you're going to start seeing cases that are False Claims Act cases based on an implied certification theory that derives from cybersecurity and HIPAA, HIPAA privacy failures, that we're seeing increasing numbers of, of HIPAA breaches, most of which are caused by uh, human stupidity and error, lost thumb drives, lost, lost uh, 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 laptop computers, many of them avoidable, lots more cases. Individuals are very rarely injured as a result of these cases, but they are subject to enhanced uh, uh, government activity, uh, there's no private right of action under HIPAA, and I think we're going to start to see, indeed we have seen uh, at least early signs of relators and private counsel bringing these cases as false certifications under the False Claims Act. And if you're looking ahead to next year, um, uh, it looks like the ICD-10 uh, is going to be finally in enacted. Uh, derived from the ICD-10 standards are the CPT and HIPPICS codes. Um, there are more categories uh, that one can bill under. There are uh, additional levels. And so I think we're going to see more upcoding cases because of arguments that a level 3 should be a level 2 or a level 4 should be a level 3. There have been lots of cases like that uh, under uh, ICD-9. I expect we're going to see a, a lot more cases once, IDC, once ICD-10 kicks in and uh, the CPT and HICPICS uh, revisions are made. Uh, in, uh, in short, um, the uh, False Claims Act uh, continues to be uh, a, a, a Damoclean sword, particularly in, in the healthcare space. I hope these comments have uh, uh, helped focus your attention on some of the recent amendments and uh, some of the, the, the likely ramifications of those amendments in terms of future litigation and enforcement. Now we're going to turn to another regime that you have to think about, Sarbanes-Oxley. Thanks, Stuart. <clears throat> this is John Fullerton, and I will speak to you for a few moments about the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and how it applies in the healthcare and life sciences space. Sarbanes-Oxley, or SOX as it's commonly called, was enacted in 2002 in response to the Enron bankruptcy and others. I, I don't want to uh, only single out Enron. There were other problems as well that led to its enactment. And it has a host of provisions regarding corporate governance, uh, the creation of audit committees and whatnot. Uh, we'll focus primarily on the whistleblower provisions. Section 806 is the civil protection for whistleblowers that prohibits adverse employment actions against whistleblowers and provides them an avenue for uh, remedying their alleged claims on an individual basis. Unlike other whistleblower laws, including the False Claims Act, including Dodd-Frank, uh, including the Internal Revenue Code and regulations, there's no monetary incentive to reward whistleblowers under Sarbanes-Oxley. There's no what we on the management side of the bar call a bounty program, uh, although the other side uh, hates that term. Um, so Section 806 on its face seems to apply clearly to public companies. So if you are in the, the healthcare life sciences space and you are publicly traded, 
uh, with a class of securities registered under Section 12, or if you are required to file reports under Section 15D, you are clearly covered by Section 806. If you are uh, an officer, employee, contractor, subcontractor, or agent of such company, you can be covered by this provision. And if covered, you are not allowed to discharge, demote, suspend, threaten, harass, or in any other manner discriminate against an employee. Keep, keep that term, an employee, in the back of your mind because it becomes relevant when we talk about the Lawson decision of the Supreme Court from this year that Stuart mentioned in his slides a moment ago. Under Section 806, you cannot discriminate against someone who externally or internally reports that the employer has violated or is violating six categories of law. So external or internal means going to the SEC, going to Congress, uh, or it means internal reporting to your supervisor, manager, human resources department, compliance department, uh, an anonymous compliance hotline, any of, any of those would be a, an example of internal reporting. And if you report that the company is engaged in frauds and swindles, fraud by wire, bank fraud, securities or commodities fraud, any violation of any rule or regulation of the uh, SEC or any other provision of federal law dealing with fraud against shareholders, uh, that they are the categories of protected activity that the statute covers. Now, with the amendment of Sarbanes-Oxley by Dodd-Frank a few years ago, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act became even more protective of whistleblowers than ever. Uh, it incorporated new provisions that invalidate any pre-dispute arbitration of whistleblower retaliation claims under SOX. Uh, it made clear that the rights and remedies under SOX cannot be waived by agreement with employees. So, for example, if you do a separation agreement, you have a general release that technically is not uh, permitted to apply to a Sarbanes-Oxley claim. The statute of limitations was expanded from 90 to 180 days. And the definition of publicly traded company covered by SOX was greatly expanded to include subsidiaries who are private but whose financial information is included in the consolidated financial statements of a publicly traded company. Now, the Supreme Court, their first decision interpreting Section 806 was issued in March of this year and it held that a SOX whistleblower, uh, the protection of, of uh, SOX Section 806 applies to employees of private companies that contract with public companies that are directly covered by the Act. So that, that the term an employee under Section 806, uh, the one side was arguing that that only applies to the employees of the publicly traded company and that the private contractor uh, can't discriminate against the employee of the publicly traded company. In fact, the Supreme Court found that it's much broader, that it applies to the employees of the private company as well. So this opened up a tremendous pool of potential whistleblower claimants uh, and makes clear that Sarbanes-Oxley's whistleblower provisions apply not only to a publicly traded company in the healthcare space, not only to a privately held company in, the, in this space, if it's a uh, subsidiary whose financials are reported up to a publicly traded company or if it is a uh, contractor to a publicly traded company and in this way would also apply to a non-for-profit that happens to be a contractor of a publicly traded company. And again, that's vis-a-vis -vis the non-profit's own employees. There are two ways I of- I would just add to that that the same thing is true under the False Claims Act by amendment. And, and uh, so uh, you, you have the same consideration of uh, what your subcontractors uh, might, might uh, do to, to uh, take revenge on a whistleblower. Exactly. Now, there are two ways in which SOX applies directly to nonprofits, and they are uh, some certain provisions regarding the retention of documents and a provision that strengthened whistleblower protection via criminal statute. So first, Section 802 makes it a crime to knowingly alter, destroy, mutilate, et cetera, 
uh, or make a false entry in any record, document, tangible object with the intent to impede, obstruct, or influence an investigation or proper administration of any matter within the jurisdiction of any federal department or agency. <coughs> Violators can be fined and or imprisoned for up to 20 years. Section 1102 has a similar and clearly overlapping uh, criminal provision um, that makes it a crime to corruptly alter, destroy, mutilate, or conceal a record or attempt to do so with the intent to impair the object's integrity or its availability for use in a, an official proceeding. A corruptly, by the way, is not defined uh, in the statute. Violators similarly may be fined or imprisoned for up to 20 years. Section 1102 also makes it a crime to otherwise obstruct, influence, or impede any official proceeding or attempt to do so. So this portion of Section 1102 is not limited to documents, false documents, destruction of documents, but anything that uh, an employer might do to obstruct, influence, or impede any official proceeding is covered. Investigations by either the Internal Revenue Service or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, among others, these are just two examples, would clearly constitute official proceedings. And so you've got a, uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act applying through these criminal statutes far more broadly than some people might have uh, otherwise realized. And that brings us to the criminal whistleblower protection in Sarbanes-Oxley that applies direct to anyone. It applies directly to not-for-profits, it, it actually applies to any person. Whoever knowingly with the intent to retaliate takes an action harmful to any person, including, and here's where the, the provision aims at employers, interference with the lawful employment or livelihood of any person for providing to a law enforcement officer, which is broadly defined in the statute, so that it includes anyone who investigates uh, or prevents uh, or prosecutes federal offenses. Um, any, if they report any truthful information relating to the commission or possible commission of any federal offense. Now, federal offense is not defined in the statute, and so there is some debate about how, how broad that term is. is. Is it only criminal provisions? Does it apply to all civil provisions? Does it apply to Title VII, for example, and, and the similar discrimination statutes. Uh, any person who does any of that shall be fined uh, under this title and imprisoned for not more than 10 years or both. A couple things to note about this whistleblower provision. The reporting must be external to a law enforcement official, so it doesn't cover internal reporting the way Section 806 uh, can cover and protect internal whistleblowing. It applies to any federal offense, not just the six categories of shareholder fraud and securities uh, irregularities that are covered by Section 806. Uh, there has not been much by way of public case law under this provision yet. If there are criminal prosecutions, they're not reaching the level of written decisions by judges. But there are a number of cases where people have, uh, in civil cases, attempted to use Section 1107 as the predicate underlying a RICO charge. Um, so it, it has, uh, it, it can play some mischief in a variety of ways. So the, the takeaways for nonprofits are that certain criminal provisions apply directly to them, uh, even though much of the statute does not. The civil whistleblower protections, although they don't apply directly to nonprofits, can apply if they are a contractor to a publicly traded company. SOX does not mandate that nonprofits implement a whistleblower policy and procedure, but most commentators would recommend that nonprofits do establish procedures in any event. It encourages individuals to come forward with a problem at an early stage so that they can be addressed, it may minimize the risk of liability under some of those other criminal provisions, and it just generally promotes an open communication for the benefit of the organization. So with that, I will turn it over to Frank to talk about issues related to crafting a whistleblower policy. Thanks, John. Uh, let's move straight on to what our real goal here is. As Stuart told you, and I think as John has helped to further explain, what is really now essential 
given the risks of litigation under a variety of federal statutory themes by both the feds and by whistleblowers themselves is that an atmosphere, a real commitment to a compliance program is ever more important. And as a result, we have to focus on under this environment, what does that mean? And how do we prevent ourselves being in the sights of relators and the government to the extent possible? Now, clearly under SOX, and as John's just described, there is some application to those obviously who are covered directly, but for those who are not covered directly, for nonprofits who are not contracting with for-profit companies who are covered uh, by SOX. Nonetheless, compliance is a hallmark. The ability to do business now frequently involves a proof of the fact that an organization is a compliant organization. Needless to say, the same thing is true in, in, under, the, under the False Claims Act uh, and the oversight of the Office of Inspector General. Exactly the same interest, don't you think, Frank? Exactly, all across the board. So this is an area where the time and effort you spend has a direct payoff and frankly is, is essentially mandatory uh, for the good conduct of your business at this point in time. The net of all of this is that in recent years, every organization, and particularly healthcare organizations, for all the reasons, again, and all the exposure that, that Stuart and John have identified for you, have turned to looking at how best to position themselves for compliance. And so there are a variety of mechanisms that are being used, and as we've outlined on the materials, things like, of course, hotlines. But those are only the beginning points. We now know that a board, whether a for-profit board or non-for-profit board should have an audit committee with a complaint procedure to be able to receive at the board level for those who choose to use no other mechanism complaints of fraud or impropriety that may violate any of the laws which have been described to you. Also supervisory channels and here training is a key element. A supervisor needs to have enough training to understand that if someone does not specifically say, I am bringing forward a claim of fraud under the False Claims Act, under Sarbanes-Oxley, under Dodd-Frank, but they give enough detail that a supervisor can recognize that that is what is being brought forward and to take that and to move it through the process so that it is promptly and effectively handled by the organization at the earliest possible time. Certainly the Office of General Counsel for an organization is another route where these matters may be brought. Within a given organization, you may have other grounds or routes for taking these matters, and you certainly want to have, frankly, I think, the more available as possible so as to get these matters internally into the process. That's not to say that your general counsel should be your chief compliance officer. In, probably the contrary. That's but. right. <laughs> in, indeed, the Office of Inspector General and DOJ argue that the best practice is to have a compliance officer who is not functioning as a lawyer, even if he or she might be a lawyer. Why? Because the government doesn't want that, the, the investigative activities of those people to be privileged. It wants to be able to get at them. And uh, that's the reason, and that's, that's what they have to say on the subject. And also why they don't like that person reporting to the Office of the General Counsel. At a, at a, that's right. And as a minimum, it's certainly a best practice that the compliance officer have a dotted line ability to report to the board or the compliance committee of the board, as Frank has just described. Okay, let's talk about uh, the internal compliance programs moving on. Uh, we really want to stop any improper activity at the earliest possible moment. That's the goal of all of your activities here. We want to be able to learn about them and then to take prompt remedial internal action before more damage can be done and before the government or a relator can make claims that we were aware of and did not promptly act. If we're going to be able to deter fraud, fiscal impropriety, we really need to have an internal compliance program which is conducive to our receiving that information at the earliest possible moment. And that's going to be the way that we protect the corporation, its shareholders to the extent we're publicly traded, or its owners to the extent we're not publicly traded, as well as patients, customers, clients, and so forth. Secondly, in this environment, we know that the regulatory expectations, whether we are publicly traded or not, are getting exceedingly more diligent all the time. So we're going to have to meet those expectations through 
that robust internal compliance program. It is, of course, part of our commitment to principles of good governance at every level of the organization. And, of course, it can be relevant, and Stuart highlighted the fact that we're looking even at more criminal proceedings, and as a relevant factor under the sentencing guidelines, the nature of our internal compliance program, reporting program, and preventing fraud and abuse is a factor under those sentencing guidelines. So you put it all together, and what it means is that there is an absolute need to have a very robust internal compliance program that we have it both in terms of policy communicated by the highest levels of the organization, repeatedly communicated, and that when we do receive matters and we're going to have some further discussion about investigations when Alan takes the, the floor, uh, that we really do that in a way that is meaningful, proper, and prompt. Let's move on. One of the questions that comes up is whether or not we could have mandatory internal reporting. Well, for those, in fact, who are covered by SOX, uh, this is a, an issue where we have, unfortunately, some statutory intervention. Many of those of you in healthcare believe mandatory reporting was necessary. Why? Because you didn't want the house to be on fire for any longer than it had to be on fire if there was an actual problem, and you correctly concluded that if you were had a mandatory internal reporting, you would be able to take corrective action where corrective action was warranted sooner. And that would give them the maximum protection to both your compliance with government mandates as well as the business and your customers and clients. And that would seem also to be consistent with the mandate of SOX that senior management affirm the accuracy of your financials. It would seem to be part and parcel of this and that it would help to give a greater level of confidence. As a result of that, there are a number of organizations that have begun to require, and frankly, we've been advising in this regard for a good while, that you really require annual certifications of employees, that there's no awareness of reporting, you know, or that they had reported any awareness of any improper activities, whether they be fraud, fiscal, or other impropriety, of which they were aware. Now, the problem here is, and let's move on, is that the protection of the whistleblowers, key component is the reporting area here. Stuart made it clear to you in his presentation, John then further helped with the statutory protections. No internal reporting program will be worth the paper it is written on or the screen on which it appears unless there is absolute protection for the good faith whistleblower. A healthcare organization really has to have an unabashed commitment to assuring that there'll be no retaliation against those who are, whistle, who are whistleblowers. And the converse of that is that we do have to invoke appropriate discipline as to anyone who does actually retaliate or attempts to retaliate against someone who is a whistleblower. If we want to get the internal reports, there is going to be a tendency of those who are good faith whistleblowers to be concerned about the consequences. We have to have created a culture and a track record that when a good faith complaint comes to us through our reporting mechanisms, that that whistleblower is going to be protected. Let me add one thing to that, Frank, which is uh, that uh, particularly with respect to the False Claims Act, an individual can go tooting off uh, and uh, notifying the Justice Department and filing a case. If you have a good uh, compliance program and clear internal protection for whistleblowers, you may be able at an early time to deputize that whistleblower as part of the solution before he or she goes to a lawyer and starts the litigation process. So you can't say enough about the importance of your point. Yeah, that, that is all part and parcel of why it is so important. All right, so let's look at for a second the whistleblower bounty program. Here's where we have an unfortunate consequence for those of you who are subject uh, to Dodd-Frank and so forth. Uh, the bounty program, as John mentioned, and I think it's the right phrase, it's an absolute in attempt by the government to incentivize the reporting. And so whistleblowers who meet a few requirements, who provide original information that's specific, credible, timely, and leads to a successful SEC proceeding where the SEC uh, recovers at least $1 million, and the way, as Stuart was describing for you, 
the uh, settlements are going, uh, that's not much of a hurdle at all in, in today's uh, marketplace. Uh, and in those circumstances, a whistleblower under the bounty program would get 10 to 30 percent of the award. As you know, some of these awards run into the hundreds of millions of dollars, so there is a tremendous incentive there for people to report, but to report through the mechanism where they can receive the bounty. There's a mandatory 10 percent a bounty when the statutory and regulatory requirements have been met. So all of this is a factor that will, in a way, undercut internal reporting mechanisms, which is all the more reason, again, why we have to do everything we can to strengthen those internal programs in the face of the bounty program. Now, moving on, we have the mandatory internal reporting problem. That is, and here's the problem, the SEC has taken the position that we may not require an individual to first internally report, despite the fact that in all logic and sense, that would be the fastest and most effective way to put an end to any improper activities. The most they are willing to say is that the person can do both and that they may consider as a factor in a bounty award if the person made an internal report before they came to the commission. But understand, ladies and gentlemen, that for those of you who are covered by the federal statutory regimes under SOX and, and Dodd-Frank, that you have a situation where you cannot require an internal report before an individual chooses to go to the government. And the same thing is true under the False Claims Act. Same thing is true under the False Claims Act. So all, again, all it means is we have to really make clear that we are an entity that will try to do the right thing internally in the face of the fact that the program cannot require a mandatory internal report and that we know that the plaintiff's bar will be out there and if an individual goes to the plaintiff's bar with a claim that is a bounty eligible claim, that they're going to probably encourage not reporting internally. So we have to do what we can. At the same time, going back to something that Frank said, there still is no reason why you can't ask as part of your training and monitoring programs employees to, to certify that they don't know of anything uh, that represents misconduct, either with respect to claims or the sort of uh, uh, financial and accounting issues that are, that are covered by SOX. And that's especially important if you're making settlements with terminated or departing employees. Okay, let's move it on. Uh, so what we see here is that internal reporting is something that we need to do what we can. But let's talk now about the rejection. Uh, as I said, the agencies have rejected, and you can see in the next slide, that the agencies have been on record as rejecting mandatory internal reports because they think that might have a chilling effect on the receipt of some reports. For all the reasons that we've said, we think that this is a bad policy choice, but it is the environment in which you must operate, so you should be aware of that environment. All right, let's move on. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we should, when we receive internal complaints, do an effective job of uh, communicating about our process and, as much as possible, the results of what we are doing in connection with a particular set of circumstances. As Stuart was just saying, and as I've been mentioning, the execution of a code of conduct uh, that you may have, code of ethics on an annual basis, and the explicit affirmation that there are, the employee is not aware of any fraud or fiscal impropriety. That plays two roles. Number one is it will undercut the credibility of the individual if they later on say, I've been aware of this for the last five years. Nonetheless, they executed that statement each and every one of those five years during their employment. And that can be helpful to us as well in terms of addressing when we have to deal with any of the enforcement agencies whether or not there is uh, actually something that, that was improper that goes on. So let's talk now about what, in fact, uh, a healthcare organization should do. Well, it's really pretty clear, moving to the next slide, that we really want corporate compliance as an absolute essential element of the way we do business every day and all day, 24-7. We really need the commitment of our C-suite without question to the program, and they need to be visible and active in this regard. 
you can consider whether or not you can provide yourselves some incentives for employees who report internally. We certainly, as we've said, have to make sure that the non-retaliation protection is well known and stringently enforced. And where we are dealing with a situation that is not one subject to the federal statutory claims, we get another perhaps argument that's available to us. Remember, in the area of sex harassment, for example, the Supreme Court said under Farragher and Ellerith that an individual who refuses to use a, an internal reporting mechanism that's available may be barred from some recovery. So when we are dealing with a situation where that argument's not foreclosed by one of the federal statutes, we may have the argument to be made in the whistleblower claim that the person had available to them are well publicized, are fully enforced and meaningful internal whistleblower protection and reporting program. They failed to use that program and this should be taken into consideration in looking at a litigation and any award to a whistleblower that could take place. We have to make sure that, in fact, at the end of the day, uh, complaints and disclosures made are promptly investigated and appropriate actions are taken. This gets complicated, as Stuart was mentioning and we were discussing, uh, because of the fact of conflicting uh, potential obligations, the role of individuals in the process, where attorney-client privilege applies and so forth, but it is something that we have to do and we have to make sure of, and the time to be doing this is now, and I know that Stuart and I and Alan and John have all been working with any numbers of our clients to try and give the appropriate robust programs so that we can have those in place to serve the important functions we've now been describing. Now, I want to touch on one other aspect of the compliance program now in the next section of the program, arbitration. Let's look at the specifics of that on the next slide. We know that a number of employers have put into effect mandatory arbitration. We know that the Supreme Court has largely blessed employer use of mandatory arbitration to resolve employment-related claims, despite the fact that the plaintiff's bar and the courts in California don't like that idea. The Supreme Court has said as long as there are reasonable procedural protections and there are not undue costs and so forth, that employers generally can do so. And why do employers like this? Well, uh, taken for a variety of reasons uh, that are not always true, but can oftentimes be true. It may be less costly than litigating the matters in court. It may well be faster, although it depends upon the court. It is definitely going to be less public uh, than litigation in court. It may cause us to be less exposed to runaway juries and uh, and very large damage exposure, although an arbitrator, again, uh, can enter what they believe to be appropriate awards. And it is largely consistent with the view that we want matters handled more internally. So for all those reasons, some employers have taken the view that they would wish to enter into and cause their employees to have a, a sign a mandatory arbitration clause. Now, going to the next slide, here, however, is to those who are covered by the statutes under Dodd-Frank, we may not we may not require, as the next slide shows, mandate uh, have a mandatory arbitration clause. I would add that this, uh, unfortunately, has no relevance to the False Claims Act. Why? Because False Claims Act cases are claims of the United States, which can't be subjected to anything like this. So the individuals who bring those cases are acting as essentially assignees of of claims that are owned by the by the government. So to the extent that you can do this at all, it will not be in the False Claims exactly. Act environment. Exactly. It's a very limited area now where you can do so. So one of the things you need to make sure of is that for those of you who might be covered, and even those who might be covered indirectly, again, as contractors to a publicly traded corporation, make sure that you do not have a try and have in place a mandatory arbitration provision that is not lawful in light of the change in the law limiting this in certain areas. So with that, that brings us, I think, logically to the next point in the program, which is how do we uh, conduct our investigations and proceed with these matters? 
Uh, this is John Fullerton. Actually, I think, Frank, in light of the time, uh, so much good stuff to talk about uh, on, on these issues that I think we're not going to be able to get to the do's and don'ts of conducting whistleblower investigations, uh, although I encourage uh, everyone to um, look at and, and make use of those slides and, and that portion of the program. Uh, instead, I think for the last few minutes, it would be best if we just open it up to any questions uh, that any of the participants might have, uh, which um, you're free to write in on the, the Q&A um, box there on your screen. We will keep the lines right open for just a few moments uh, to, to await any uh, questions that our participants might have to submit. While we're, while we're waiting for that, I can add a point to something that Frank said. Frank talked about the elements of a, an effective compliance program, and they're spelled out in, in uh, uh, guidance to the organizational sentencing uh, guidelines, to the OIG uh, uh, requirements in the, in the healthcare area. I note that uh, recently the head of the Department of Justice Criminal uh, Division set forth a list that has one new element in it, and I think she's correct. In, adding that element, and that is measuring and testing how your compliance program is doing. A good compliance program ought to be able to produce results, and you ought to have systems in place to monitor that uh, so that, so that you, can, you can report on, on how you solve problems. Great. Well, we certainly appreciate everybody's participation this afternoon. Um, as a reminder, uh, you are welcome to submit questions directly to the speakers um, using um, their contact information that we will pull up here for you. Um, as a reminder, approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the recording and also access to these PowerPoint materials. There were certainly a few questions about that, um, and we will absolutely be providing that via email um, in the coming few days. Um, so at this time, we will conclude the webinar, and we would, again, just like to thank you all for taking the time to participate with us this afternoon. Thank you so much.